I welcome all of you to our Fahm al Quran 2022 session number nine. So, inshallah, let us begin with a recap. So last uh, uh, last time, yesterday, in Surat Araf, we learned about the story of Adam alayhi salam and Iblis. In the most detailed account, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, he asked, the uh, he asked the malaika, the angels, to prostrate to him. So Iblis immediately refused to comply by this command because he thought he was superior to Adam because he was made of fire. This disobedience led him towards arrogance, and this arrogance led him to be expelled from Jannah forever. Now, when we look at the story, subhanAllah, even though we're centuries apart now, yet there is a profound lesson that we can learn. What is it? The danger of pride, the danger of arrogance. As human beings, we all have the tendency to become proud sometimes, right? But there are different stages of pride. There are different degrees of pride. It could be on a micro level to the point that when someone tries to correct us for our mistake, our ego kicks in and we refuse. Or it could be on a macro level when we start belittling people around us because we feel they are inferior than us. Any kind of pride is discouraged in Islam. So the question is, how do we curb pride? How do we curb pride? So there are a few key points mentioned over here. Number one, through ilm, through knowledge, understanding the severity of pride. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one will not enter Jannah if he has an Adam's weight of arrogance in his or her heart. SubhanAllah, that's how dangerous it is. Number two, realizing the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembering our shortcomings. Remembering our shortcomings, that we are weak. We make mistakes. So there's no reason to be arrogant about our own selves. There's no reason to be boastful, inshallah. Number three, what else can we do to curb pride? Salah on an individual level and Hajj on a communal level. SubhanAllah, yes, even they curb pride. So what happens when we all stand together, shoulder to shoulder, despite the differences of our skin color, ethnicity, social status, we realize that we're all equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except who? Except the one who has more taqwa. He'll be higher in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll be better in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the characteristics of taqwa is humility. So the crux of the matter is arrogance is not worth it. Pride is not worth it. Having ego issues is not worth it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from following the footsteps of Iblis and enable us to practice the humility of our father, Adam alayhi salam. Ameen. So with that said, inshallah, we will begin our session for today. We will begin from Surah Araf, ayah number 51. So let's begin. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-lazina attakhadhu deenahum lahwa wa la'iba wa gharrathum al-hayatu al-dunya. Fal-yawma nansahum kama nasu liqa'a yawmihim hadha. Wa ma kanu bi ayatina yajhadun. Who took their religion as an amusement and play, and the life of the world deceived them. So this day we shall forget them, as they forgot the meeting of this day, and as they used to reject our ayat. Certainly we have brought to them a book, the Qur'an, which we have explained in detail with knowledge, a guidance and a mercy to a people who believe. Await, they just for the final fulfillment of the event. On the day the event is finally fulfilled, 
Those who neglected it before will say, Verily, the messengers of our Lord did come with the truth. Now are there any intercessors for us that they might intercede on our behalf? Or could we be sent back to the first life of the world so that we might do good deeds other than those evil deeds which we used to do? Verily, they have lost their own selves. They have destroyed their own selves, and that which they used to fabricate has gone away from them. So meaning when a person sees loss in front of his eyes on the day of Qiyamah, he will rely on two factors. Either he will wish to go back to this dunya so that he can amend his ways, or he will depend on intercession. Maybe the prophet can intercede for me. Maybe the malaika can intercede for me. SubhanAllah. So those people who always gave preference to dunya over deen, to this worldly life over akhira, then they will eventually be in utter loss. I number 54. Indeed, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days. And then he rose over Istava, the throne, really in a manner that suits his majesty. He brings the night as a cover over the day, seeking it rapidly. And he created the sun, the moon, the stars, subjected to his command. Surely his is the creation and command. Blessed is Allah, the Lord of the Alameen. So again, this... Um, tells us the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is ultimately the creator of each and everything. Because who can create the entire heavens and the earth in six days, right? The heavens include all the different skies. SubhanAllah, there's seven different layers of skies and science has only discovered the first sky, the lowest sky, the one that we see above us, all the galaxies, all the Milky Ways, the universe, everything resides within this lowest heaven, within this lowest sky. And then, subhanAllah, there are six more skies above it. Imagine who can create this all within six days, right? No one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, invoke your Lord with humility and in secret, because he likes not the aggressors. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us, humility is preferred because humility is the character of Adam alayhi salam and all the prophets, whereas pride is the characteristic of Iblis. So we should stay away from him. And do not do mischief on the earth after it has been set in order and invoke him with fear and hope. Surely Allah's mercy is ever near to the ones who do good. So meaning we should always be in the midst of khawf and tama, fear and hope. No matter how much we excel, no matter how many good deeds we do, no matter how many um, hasanat we perform, we should always be in between khawf and tama. We should be fearful about our shortcomings, our mistakes, our sins, yet we should be hopeful in the mercy of Allah. And it is he who sends the winds as heralds of glad tidings going before his mercy till when they have carried heavy laden clouds, we drive it to a land that is dead. Then we cause water rain to descend thereon. Then we produce every kind of fruit therewith. Similarly, we shall raise up the dead so that you may remember or take heed. So subhanAllah, an analogy is being presented over here. Just like when rain falls, it brings life to the grass. It brings life to the plants, to the trees, to the flowers, just like that, subhanAllah. Our dead bodies will eventually be resurrected. Just like how the lifeless plants and trees, they bloom. We will bloom up as well. When? On the day of Qiyamah. The vegetation of a good land comes forth easily by the permission of its Lord. And that which is bad brings forth nothing which is Nothing but a little with difficulty. Thus do we explain variously the ayat for a people who give thanks. Indeed, we sent Nuh to his people and he said, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other ilah but him. Certainly, I fear for you the torment of a great day. So after mentioning about Adam alayhi salam, now the surah tells us another great prophet, again in the chronological order, Nuh alayhi salam. And we know that Nuh alayhi salam is one of the Ulul Azam, the five greatest prophets. So what did he do? 
even he invited his community, his nation, his ummah towards Islam. Then what did the people do? How did they react? I number 60, the leaders of his people said, verily, we see you in plain error, meaning they started mocking at Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam said, oh my people, there is no error in me, but I'm a messenger from the Lord of the Adami. I convey, to do, I convey to you the messages of my Lord and give sincere advice to you. I know from Allah what you know not. SubhanAllah. Nasiha comes from Noon Sadha, which means a word which is intended for good, which means good for the other person, which brings khair kaseer for the other person. So Noon alayhi salam is basically telling the people that I am telling you all this for your own good. And subhanAllah, we have seen this even at our times that when we try to correct someone, when we try to convey something good to someone, what happens, subhanAllah? People think that we wish evil for them. The reason why we're stopping them to follow their desires, people think we wish evil for them. SubhanAllah, little do they know that we only intend good. For instance, when you tell your children to pray salah, right? The children think it's a burden. It's too difficult. Why are these shackles being put around me to pray five times a day? But subhanAllah, in the long run, we know that this is good for them. This is clear for them. So again, from the legacy of the prophets, we learn that just like how hadith they were for the hidayah of their people, just like that, we need to be hadith for hidayah for our children, our family members, our relatives, our community members, so that inshallah, we can be all together with each other in Jannah. I number 63, do you wonder that there has come to you a reminder from your Lord through a man from amongst you that he may warn you so that you may fear Allah and that you may receive his mercy, but they denied him. So we saved him and those along with him in the ship and we drowned those who denied our ayat. They were indeed blind people. It's mentioned that the period between Adam alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam was 10 centuries. So it was a very, very long time. And we also know that Nuh alayhi salam even lived a very long life, right? SubhanAllah. So the, the, the crux of the matter is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent each prophet towards people for their hidayah. Every nation received a prophet so that he can guide them. But then some believed and succeeded Whereas a lot of them denied and subhanAllah, they became the reason of their own loss. I number 65, and to add the people, we sent their brother Hud. Again, chronological in the chronological order, next came Hud alayhi salam down the line. He said, oh my people worship Allah, you have no other ilah but him. Will you not fear Allah? The leaders of those who disbelieved among his people said, Verily, we see you in foolishness, and verily, we think you are one of the liars. So what was the problem of the people of Ad? Their problem was that they used to make high buildings as landmarks. And they used to feel very proud of their accomplishment. And subhanAllah, in 1990, there was an archaeological finding which revealed this lost city and named it the Atlantis of the Sands Uber. So this is, in fact, a reality that we still are able to see the remnants of them today. But because they became so proud and arrogant and followed the footsteps of Iblis, then they were defeated and they were destroyed eventually. So when their prophet Hud alayhi salam tried to invite them towards Islam, tried to call them towards Hidayah, what did they say? This is foolishness. And this is one of the lies. You are one of the liars. So we do not believe in you. Hud alayhi salam said, oh my people, there is no foolishness in me. And I am a messenger from the Lord of the Alameen. I convey to you the messages of my Lord and I am a trustworthy advisor for you. So each prophet mentioned to their nation that I am a nasih. I am the one who is giving a nasiha to you, something which intends good for you, but you are the one who keeps on rejecting. 
Do you wonder that there has come to you a reminder from your Lord through a man from amongst you to warn you and remember that he made you successors after the people of Nuh and increased you employ in stature. So remember the graces from Allah so that you may be successful. So it's mentioned that when these people kept on denying over and over again, one day the weather changed um, suddenly and a furious violent wind um, destroyed them, which was imposed on them for seven nights and eight days until the lush green land that they lived on turned into ruins and subhanAllah, the entire city was destroyed. It was swallowed up. And who remained? Hud alayhi salam and few of his followers were saved. They were secured and they migrated to a place called Hadramaut, which is now known as Yemen. So that was their end. So they said, have you come to us that we should worship Allah alone and forsake that which our fathers used to worship? So bring us that wherewith you threaten us if you are truthful. Hud alayhi salam said, torment and wrath have already fallen on you from your Lord. Dispute do you, do you dispute me over the names which you have named you and your fathers with no authority from Allah? Then wait, I am with you among those who wait. So we saved him and those who were with him by a mercy from us, and we cut the roots of those who denied our ayat, and they were not believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives some time of respite to these nations, to these people, so that they can correct their ways. But when they persist upon sin over and over again, despite all the reminders, despite all the nasiha, that's when the punishment descends. So next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about another group of people. Who are they? Thamud. And to Thamud, their brother Saleh was sent. He said, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other ilah but him. Indeed, there has come to you a clear sign, the miracle of the coming out of a huge she-camel from the midst of a rock from your Lord. This she-camel of Allah is a sign to you. So you leave her to graze in the earth of Allah and touch her not with harm, lest a painful torment would seize you. So while their ancestors Ad were very good architects, Samud were masterminds in architecture as well. So what would they do? They would carve magnificent castles in the mountain. So subhanAllah, when we spoke about Ad, what did they do? Ad used to create, they used to build very lofty buildings on top of the mountain. That itself is something hard, right? Even now we find very rare, subhanAllah, architecture construction, which is on top of the mountains, right? It's very hard. So that's rare. And that's something they would do, but their generation, Thamud were even better than them in terms of their technology and infrastructure. So what would they do? They would actually create mansions and houses within the mountain. So they would actually carve houses within the mountain, subhanAllah, to which remains are still found, subhanAllah. So even then, uh, even them, what did they do? They became proud over their accomplishments. So their prophet Salih alayhi salam reminded them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember when he made you successors after Ad and gave you inhabitants, habitations in the land, you build for yourselves palaces and plains and carve out homes in the mountains. So remember the graces from Allah and do not go about making mischief on the earth. So why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that fadhkuru ala Allahi? Because whatever ability that we have, whatever infrastructure that we create, whatever new technology that we come up, we ourselves claim to be masterminds, but who actually gave us this mind to think about initially? Who gifted us with this brain, subhanAllah, so that we can come up with all these new ideas on the first place? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So Allah says, فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ اللَّهِ Remember the graces of Allah. And what should you not do? وَلَا تَعْثَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Do not make mischief on the land. Whatever blessings that you have been given, 
act hu with humility, be humble, do not be proud and arrogant, do not create fasad. The leaders of those who were arrogant amongst his people said to those who were counted weak, to such of them as believed, know you that Salih is one sent from his Lord. They said, we indeed believe in that which he has been sent. Those who were arrogant said, verily, we disbelieve in that which you believe. Meaning even in the Pro in Prophet Saleh alayhi salam, there were some people who believed in him and there were some people who rejected him. So what happened? These people, they demanded that we need to see a she camel coming out of Iraq. Meaning they wanted to see a miracle because that's not possible, right? Every she camel needs to be born out of her mother. It cannot come just like that. So they wanted to see this miracle and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled their request. But subhanAllah, what did they do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so they killed the she camel and insolently defied the commandment of their Lord and said, O Salih, Bring about your threats if you are indeed one of the messengers of Allah. So when miracles take place, they are basically a sign from Allah. We shouldn't harm them. We shouldn't hurt them because they are one of the signs of Allah. But what did they do? They killed the she camel. And on top of that, they had so much arrogance that they asked Saleh alayhi salam, okay, now bring the punishment to us. We have killed a she camel. Now show us the punishment that you threaten us with. So what happened? So the earthquake seized them and they led, they lay dead prostrating in their homes. So their punishment was that an earthquake came and hit them and all of them were destroyed. Then he, Saleh, turned from them and said, O oh my people, I have indeed conveyed to you the message of my Lord and have given you good advice, but you do not like good advisors, the people who do good. SubhanAllah. So this tells us that no matter how advanced a nation is in terms of their science, in terms of their infrastructure, in terms of their technology, if they are not humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they are boastful, if they are proud, then it takes seconds for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to destroy an entire community, an entire nation. So the crux of the matter is that we should always be humble and we should always refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever accomplishments that I'm able to make, it is from Allah. It is due to Allah. So alhamdulillah, all things to him. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention about Lut alayhi salam because in chronological order, they are the nation who came next. And remember Lut when he said to his people, do you commit the worst sin such as none preceding you has committed in the alameen before? Verily, you practice your lusts on men instead of women. No, but you are a people transgressing beyond bounds. So what was their problem? Their problem was homosexuality. And the answer of his people was only that they said, drive them out of your town. These are indeed men who want to be pure. So when Lut salam would invite them towards Islam, when Lut salam would educate them to shun the sin altogether, what would they say? They would say, oh yeah, you are people who are You're the people who want to be pure. And that's something which is so common, right? Even nowadays, people say that. When you try to advise someone to refrain from something evil, what do they say? Oh yeah, you're the one who is the most religious person on earth. You think you're the one who's the most purest from sins? Oh yeah, right. Let me tell you how you were 10 years ago, right? So they guilt trip you. They guilt trip you. So what did these people do? They also guilt trip their prophet by saying, oh yeah, you claim that all sanctity belongs to you. You're the one who's the most pure. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then we saved him and his family except his wife. She was of those who remained behind in the torment. So Lut alayhi salam kept telling his nation, kept educating his nation, his people to leave the sin, but 
because they persisted in their sin, eventually they were destroyed. And how they were destroyed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we rain down on them a rain of stones, then see what was the end of the criminals. So rain came onto them, the rain of stones, earthquake was sent to them, all sorts of punishments were actually sent to them because they initiated the sin. They were the ones who came up with this sin, which was amongst the worst of sins. So the worst kind of punishment was given to them. And subhanAllah, when people were saved from the punishment, subhanAllah, it was Lut and his followers, his children, they say uh, Lut had daughters, so they were saved, but his wife, his own spouse was not saved. She was not saved. Why? Because she was sympathetic towards his people, towards his community. And that tells us that even if we do not indulge in any kind of sin, if we feel sympathetic towards the criminals, towards the sin, even that is wrong. Even that is wrong. And that's scary, right? The sin of the wife of Lut was only the fact that she sympathized with her people. And because of that, she was destroyed. So we have to be careful. When there is a sin which is wrong, we claim from our heart and our tongue that we affirm that it is wrong and it needs to be avoided at all costs. We cannot encourage people to commit the crime commit the sin, just like what the wife of Lut did. I number 85, and to the people of Madian, we sent their brother Shu'ayb. He said, oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other ilah but him. Verily, a clear proof from your Lord has come to you. So give full measure and full weight and do not wrong men in their things, and do not do mischief on the earth. After it has been sent in order, that will be better for you if you are believers. So down the line, who is the next prophet? Shu'aib alayhi salam. And he was sent to the people of Madian. And what was their crime? Their crime was cheating, deception. They wouldn't give full measure. They would cheat. So, uh, so Shu'aib alayhi salam came to educate them. And sit not on every road, threatening and hindering from the path of Allah, those who believe in him, and seeking to make it crooked. And remember when you were but few, and he multiplied you, and see what was the end of the mischief makers. So another crime that they indulged in was that they would hinder people from the path of Allah. So even this is a crime. And we should refrain from it. And if there is a party of you who believe in that which I have been sent, and a party who do not believe, so be patient until Allah judges between us. And he is the best of judges. The best of judges. So subhanAllah, we see that any kind of crimes that are mentioned in the Quran, we need to take them seriously and we need to stay away from it. Because these nations were destroyed because they persisted in these very sins. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and we need to try our best to stay away from them, inshallah. So that was the conclusion of juz number eight. Now we will begin juz number nine. I number 88, Surah Ara. The chiefs of those who were arrogant among his people said, we shall certainly drive you out, O Su'ayb, and those who have believed with you from our town, or else you all shall return to our religion. He said, even though we hate it. So we notice that all the prophets, they faced trials. All of them faced opposition from their people in different ways. But the reason for all hostility was one and only. The fact that the prophets invited them to Islam. The fact that they invited them to worship one Lord without any partners. So same thing happened with Shu'aib alayhi salam as well. His nation said to him that we will not agree with you. You are not welcome here. And if you want to stay here with us, then there is one condition. You have to become like us. The response of Shu'aib alayhi salam was, even if we are unwilling, even if we are not ready for this, subhanAllah, there's so many things that we can compromise with. 
but we move on. For instance, many a times we love someone dearly, but when he or she passes away, what happens eventually, we cry, we weep, but we move on. Or there could be a certain residence. We had a special place for that house in our heart. We loved that house. We were emotionally attached to that house. Um, and subhanAllah, what happens? Your husband finds a new job and you have to sell the house. You have to move to a different location. Even though it's very hard for you, despite your yearning for it, what ends up happening? We make a compromise, right? We make a compromise and we adjust to the new house, to the new community, to the new um, locality. We compromise, we adjust. So we make a lot of compromises in life. But Iman, it's not something we can compromise with. So the nation of Shu'aib asked him to make this compromise. But how about you worship our Lord for a few days and we will worship your Lord for a few days. So Shuaib immediately responded that you want me to be like you? Never. I can never adopt the pathway of kufr. Same thing happened with Rasulullah as well, right? The people of Makkah wanted to make a settlement with him that if you worship our gods for one day, we're ready to worship Allah for many days. Just give us one day. Out of the whole entire year, just give us one day. But what did the Prophet ﷺ respond? He said, if they put the sun on my right hands and the moon on my left, I will never associate partners with my Rabb. Not even for a day. Now putting ourselves in the shoes of the Prophet and thinking from that mindset, do you think, will they ever be pleased Will people ever be pleased if we compromised one salah? Just because my friend is throwing a party and I do not want to pray, do you think our Prophet وسلم, who sacrificed so much for our sake so that one day Islam can reach us and benefit us and reach our children and all our generations to come? Do you think Today, if the Prophet Sallallahu was to visit us, would he be pleased to see us skipping salah because of a party that was going on? Do you think that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam be pleased to see us taking off our hijabs at school when our parents are not around? Do you think when the scrolls of our deeds will be presented on the day of judgment, will Allah be pleased with us? Will Allah be pleased with us to see that in dunya, we usurped the property of others? Why? To earn some measly benefit. No. Iman is something which cannot be compromised. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is something which cannot be compromised. Following his legacy cannot be compromised. But unfortunately, we do not take our deen seriously. We do not. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. Amen. I number 89. We should have invented a lie against Allah if we returned to your religion after Allah has rescued us from it. And it is not for us to return to it unless Allah, our Lord, should will. Our Lord comprehends all things in his knowledge. In Allah, we put our trust. Our Lord, judge between us and our people in truth, for you are the best of those who give judgment. The chiefs of those who disbelieved among his people said to their people, if you follow Shuraib, be sure that you will be the losers. So they threatened him. But what happened? The earthquake seized them and they, led, prost they lay dead, prostrating in their homes. Those who denied Shu'aib became as if they had never dwelt there in their homes. Those who denied Shu'aib, they were the losers. Then he, then he Shu'aib turned from them and said, O oh my people, I have indeed conveyed my Lord's messages to you, and I have given you good advice. Then how can I grieve for a disbelieving people? And we sent no prophet to any town, 
but they denied him. But we seized its people with suffering from extreme poverty and loss of health and calamities so that they might humble themselves and repent to Allah. So what happens when a nation falls into sin? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends towards them a minor sign. A minor sign. What is it? Let's see. Allah says, then we change the evil for the good until they increased in number and in wealth and said, our fathers were touched with evil, loss of health and calamities and with good prosperity. So we seized them all of a sudden while they were unaware. So when a nation falls into sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't immediately send punishment towards them. Allah sends towards them a minor sign, maybe a kind of illness, maybe a calamity, a temporary form of test, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shakes them up to wake them up. And the biggest example that we can reflect upon is the onset of COVID-19. SubhanAllah. How it shook the entire world, right? So many people afflicted due to this one disease. So many people passing away just due to this one disease, one illness, one sickness. And this is a sign for us. So that if we are away from Islam, we can accept it. So that if we are deviated, we can come back to Hidayah. So these are signs around us. These signs are alive. And we can see them right in front of our eyes. But unfortunately, what do we do? We keep hitting the snooze button and keep falling to sleep. We keep falling asleep thinking that it's just a part of life. It's okay. That's how our forefathers were afflicted. In their time, there was something else. There were AIDS going on. There were other diseases that were going on. It's okay. That's part of life. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this is the plan of Allah. Allah replaces evil with good. But then when people, rather than taking it as a sign, they persist in sinning, then that's when the ultimate punishment comes. So again, the signs are around us. We need to wake up rather than hitting this nose button. We need to look at our actions and correct ourselves. And if the people of the towns had believed and had taqwa, certainly we should have opened for them blessings from the heaven and the earth. But they denied the messengers. So we took them with punishment for what they used to earn. Did the people of the towns then feel secure against the coming of our punishment by night while they were asleep? Or did the people of the towns then feel secure against the coming of our punishment in the forenoon while they were playing? Did they then feel secure against the plan of Allah? None feels secure. None feels secure from the plan of Allah except the people who are losers. So the people of Shu'ayb salam, even though they were successful businessmen, entrepreneurs, yet What's the state of those successful people? Ultimately, they were eliminated from the face of the earth. Why? Because they did not follow their prophet. SubhanAllah. So what do we learn here? No matter how much success we may have in life, the real success is the success of the hereafter. The real success is the success of hereafter. I number 100. It is, is it not clear to those who inherit the earth in succession from its previous possessors that had we built, we would have punished them for their sins and we seal up their hearts so they hear not. Those were the towns whose story we relate to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there came indeed to them their messengers with clear proofs, but they were not to believe in that which they had rejected before. Thus Allah does seal up the hearts of the disbelievers. And most of them we find not true to their covenant, but most of them we find indeed rebellious. 
ay number 103. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention to us the story of Musa alayhi salam. Then after them, we sent Musa with our signs to Fir'aun and his chiefs, but they wrongfully rejected them. So see, how was the end of the mischief makers? How was the end of the corruptors, the people who cause corruption? And Musa said, O Fir'aun, verily I am the messenger from the Lord of the Alameen. Proper it is for me that I say nothing concerning Allah, but the truth. Indeed, I have come to you from your Lord with a clear proof to let the children of Israel depart along with me. So Musa السلام, basically had two goals, two main goals. What was it? First of all, to inform Fir'aun and his people to worship Allah alone. And secondly, to tell him to let the Bani Israel go, to set them free. So that's what he mentioned to Fir'aun. Fir'aun said, if you have come with a sign, show it forth. If you are one of those who tell the truth. So Fir'aun presented his own demand. Then Musa alayhi salam threw his stick and behold, it was a thu'adan mubin. It was a serpent manifest. It became a huge python. So this was a miracle that was given to Musa alayhi salam that his staff, his stick would convert into a serpent with the izn of Allah. And what else was a miracle given to him? And he drew out his hand and behold, it was white with radiance for the beholders, subhanAllah. So this hand, which was by it was not due to any affliction, due to any health issues. It was white, radiant, shining. And that's not possible, subhanAllah, even if we use the most brightest of flashlights. This was indeed a miracle. The chiefs of the people of Pharaoh said, this is indeed a bell worst sorcerer. So meaning the people started plotting against him, against Fir'aun by injecting false ideas into the ears of Fir'aun. He wants to get you out of your land. So what do you advise? And this is the irony of life. Whenever someone wants to give some good advice, what do people say? Don't listen to him. They have a secret agenda. She has a secret agenda that she's trying to fulfill. Don't listen to him. So that's exactly what the people around Fir'aun did. They said, put him and his brother off for a time and send callers to the city to collect. That they bring to you all well-versed sorcerers. And so the sorcerers came to Fir'aun. They said, indeed, there will be a good reward for us if we are victorious. He said, yes, and moreover, you will be in that case, be the nearest to me. So the magicians, they demanded compensation from Fir'aun. Why? Because their goal was to attain, attain the dunya, the rewards of dunya, the pleasures of dunya. But Musa alayhi salam didn't demand any compensation. He didn't charge any fee to abide by the request of Fir'aun because his goal was not dunya. It was akhirah. So we should check our intentions. What is our intention behind doing anything good? Is our intention only seeking dunya or is it akhirah? So what did these magicians do? They asked Fir'aun for a reward. And Fir'aun said, definitely, you will be in that case very near to me, meaning if you are able to do what I expect from you, meaning if you're able to defeat Moses, then you will automatically become very close to me. I will give you a cabinet position and give you good salary. They said, oh, Musa, indeed, you throw first or shall we throw first? So now there are Ellipse, uh, eclipse, there, there are ellipses in the scene. And now you can imagine that the, the scene has changed where all the people are gathered. There is audience. There are a whole group of magicians. And then there is Musa alayhi salam. And amongst the audience is Fir'aun. And the show is on. So the magicians are asking Musa alayhi salam, do you want to go ahead and throw first? Or should we go first? So what did Musa alayhi salam choose? Musa alayhi salam said, you throw first. 
So when they threw, they bewitched the eyes of the people and struck terror into them, and they displayed a great magic. So what was the wisdom behind Musa salam asking the magicians to go first? Right? What was the wisdom behind it? So that you're able to see what they are capable of doing. So that you are able to see what their potential is. And then you know your target. What's your target to beat? And you get to have the last word. And that can have a lasting impact on people. So what happened next? And we revealed to Musa saying, throw your stick and behold, it swallowed up straight away all the falsehood which they showed. So over here in subhanAllah, we see that the time, the point of time when these magicians threw their sticks, it was an illusion because magic is not real, right? So there was an illusion which casted fear into the eyes of people. It struck terror into their hearts. And of course, Musa -Islam is a human being as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforted Musa alayhi salam and revealed to him, now is the time, throw your stick and you will be successful. So what happened as soon as he threw his stick, it, the, it's, uh, it became, it transformed into a serpent and it swallowed all the snakes, the tiny little snakes that were moving and the magicians were utterly defeated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thus the truth was confirmed, and all that they did was wait of no effect, of no effect, meaning the truth was established. The power of magic was destroyed. How? Through one ayah, one miracle was enough to destroy and break the magic of these expert magicians. And that is in fact true. That is in fact true. If someone is affected due to black magic or they have been possessed. What's the most powerful resource we have to overcome magic? It is Quran. That is the cure, right? So just like this miracle was an ayah, was a sign for Musa salam to win. If we want to overcome magic, what is the biggest miracle that we have? It is the Quran. So we need to use that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, make good use of two cures honey and Quran, because in it, it's Shifa. I number 119. So they were defeated and they returned disgraced. And the sorcerers fell down in prostration. Meaning the sorcerers immediately realized that what Musa salam presented was not magic. This was real because they know all the tricks and strategies of magic. So they immediately realized that indeed, this is a miracle. And indeed, Musa salam is the messenger of Allah. So as soon as they realized, they all fell down in prostration. They said, we believe in the Lord of the Adam, the Lord of Moses and Aaron. So over here, we realize that as soon as we realize Al-Haq, as soon as we realize the truth, we shouldn't delay. We, we shouldn't procrastinate thinking that, okay, now let me think over it. Let me ask my family. Let me consult a group of friends. And then maybe I'll accept. Then maybe I'll comply. No, subhanAllah, immediate, immediate acceptance. As soon as they realized, they fell down in prostration, not even thinking about the consequences it's going to bring them, right? Immediately they surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what happened? The audience includes Fir'aun. Fir'aun is seeing this entire scene and he sees the defeat of the magicians against Musa alayhi So what happened? He was enraged. So Fir'aun said, you have believed in him before I give you permission. So meaning Fir'aun was very furious. He was like, how dare you accept Islam? How dare you are defeated before Moses? Surely this is a plot which you have plotted in the city to drive out its people, but you shall come to know. So he blamed and accused the magician, magicians saying that this was an entire plot 
to defame me, to defeat me. But soon you're going to know because I'm going to punish you. Surely I will cut off your hands and your feet from opposite sides. Then I will crucify you all. And this was a huge threat, right? This was a huge threat because losing one of your arms, one of your feet, and also being crucified is a very painful punishment. But subhanAllah, what did they respond? They said, verily, we are returning to our Lord. SubhanAllah, what level of Iman? Within how many minutes? Within a few minutes. They did not go through a whole certificate course. They did not complete an entire degree on Aqida. Just within minutes, they reached the peak, the epitome of Iman. Despite hearing the biggest punishment ever that was coming towards them, Yet, they did not fear. They did not shake. What did they say? قَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَىٰ رَبِّنَا مُنْقَلِبُونَ It's okay. You want to punish us? Punish us. Eventually, everyone has to die. So why not today? Fine. No problem. And you take vengeance on us only because we believed in the ayat of our Lord when they reached us? They made dua, Rabbana afriq alayna sabira wa tawathana muslimin. Our Lord, pour out on us patience and cause us to die as Muslims. Ifraq literally means to pour out everything all together, like how you would pour the entire water jug in a glass. So they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, we are weak. So you pour all the sabr supply to us, the entire package of sabr on us. We need it. Please grant this so that we can download this into our system. So they made dua to Allah. SubhanAllah. Imagine they do not know how to pray salah. They do not know any fundamentals of Islam, nothing whatsoever. Yet, they immediately made dua. They asked Allah for help. What do we learn here? When we are afflicted with a problem, we don't have to call a friend, our parents, call so-and-so. First of all, first and foremost, call 1-800-ALLAH-HELPLINE. Call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make dua, besiege Allah, supplicate to him. And once we have done that, yes, we can go and book an appointment with the doctor. Yes, we can share the news with our parents. Yes, we can share the diagnosis with a friend. But first and foremost, we have to make dua. We have to ask Allah for help. The chiefs of Fir'aun people, they said, will you leave Moses and his people to spread mischief in the land and to abandon you and your gods? He said, we will kill their sons and let live their women and we have indeed irresistible power over them. So again, these chiefs are infecting the mind of the own. That now that you are utterly defeated, don't leave Moses just like that so that they can create mischief on the earth, so that they can abandon you and your gods. No. Punish them. Punish him and all his followers. Punish them. Moses said to his people, seek help in Allah and be patient. Verily, the earth belongs to Allah. He gives it as a heritage to whom he wills of his slaves. And the blessed end is for the pious. So Moses, Musa alayhi salam, is again comforting people. Why? Because he knows what's coming next. He knows the repercussions of this action. He knows that life is going to become difficult very soon. So again, what does he tell his people? Seek help in Allah and be patient. Now, the format of this ayah is, Musa says, Ista'inu billahi wasfiru. It's not the other way around. Patience is not mentioned. First, why is that? 
Because when we seek help from Allah, that's when Allah grants us patience as well. We don't know how to be patient, right? We're so weak. We're so weak. So even to acquire patience, we need to sell, seek help in Allah. For instance, at times we come across situations where a girl gets married off to a person who is abusive. And she feels there's no way out for her, right? All her freedom, like her cell phone going out, all her privileges are taken away from her. And she feels apprehensive that, Ya Allah, what do I do now? I'm all alone in this foreign country. Who will help me against this abuse? How will I survive? Right? So what's the solution to this? Start praying to Allah. Start calling Allah secretly and Allah will definitely help you. He will open different avenues for you in order to grant you safety. Sometimes we see situation when people are diagnosed with an incurable disease. And that comes to them as a shock that, oh my God, what do I do now? How am I going to endure the pain? Will I be able to receive treatment? How is this treatment going to be like? Is it going to be very painful? Is it going to give me side effects? Again, in moments like these, what should we do? Rather than taking on that stress, rather than going into depression, what should we do? Start whispering to Allah, start making dua. If life is written for you, Allah will give it to you no matter what your medical diagnosis is. And if death is written for you, inshallah, you will meet your Rabb in the state of dhikr, in the state of dua. So be content, despite the fact that you weren't able to win against your sickness in this life, inshallah, you're guaranteed to win eternal bliss in Akhirah. So whatever situation may be, what should we do? Ista'inu billahi wasbiru. They said, we the children of Israel have suffered troubles before you came to us and since you have come to us. He said, it may be that your Lord will destroy your enemy and make you successors on the earth so that he may see how you act. So subhanAllah, who are these people who are saying to Musa alayhi salam that, Ya Musa, before you came and after you came, we only are seeing troubles. We're only suffering. Who are making all these complaints? SubhanAllah. Two sets of people are mentioned over here, okay? One set is Bani Israel and one set are those magicians who accepted Islam. The magicians were eventually punished by Fir'aun. So their limbs were cut off from opposite sides and they were crucified. So they were martyred. They received martyrdom and they died. Now who remains? The Bani Israel. These are the people who are complaining to Musa alayhi salam. That Ya Musa, Ya Moses, what's the difference? We suffered before you came to us and after you came to us. What's the difference? There's nothing new. We, are, we do not have any security. So Musa alayhi salam, despite their disrespect towards him, despite the mistreatment that they were giving to their own prophet, Musa alayhi salam said, it may be that your Lord will destroy your enemy and make you successors on the earth so that he may see how you act. So we can still see, subhanAllah, the uttermost respect that Musa alayhi salam has when he speaks to people. When he speaks to people. So he's still giving them hope. He's still giving them hope. Even though the situation around them is very traumatic. It's very traumatic. What are the chiefs of Pharaoh telling Pharaoh to, to stop this, um, you know, stop this scene going on and just kill Moses and their sons and just, you know, give them pain, you know, just 
give them all the emotional, psychological torture that you can. And listening to those chiefs, um, Faraon gave in to this suggestion, which tells us the effects of bad companionship. When an oppressor receives support from other oppressors, then his persecution intensifies. So what happened when he got the full support from his cabinet, he boastfully issued the order to kill all baby boys. Persecution against children started once again. Remember, it used to be done during the time when Musa salam, was born, right? Why did it happen? Because Fir'aun feared that the Israelites will overpower all the Egyptians due to a dream that he saw, okay? So the law was passed at that time, but over time, his cabinet suggested to him that if you keep killing all the baby boys, then you will lose all your workforce. The economy of the country will fail. So what happened? The killing order was hampered for some time. So what did they do? They started killing on alternate years in order to save the economy. So one year they would kill all the baby boys and the other year they would not. So the year when Musa salam, was born, they were killing all the baby boys. That's why the mother of Moses put him in that casket. But the year when Harun salam, was born, it was the year when the baby boys were not killed. So the killing order was hampered. It was changed to a certain extent. But now when Fir'aun faced this ultimate defeat by Moses, by Musa salam, all his magicians, they started injecting this idea into Fir'aun's head that you have to finish the Israelites. You have to start another fresh episode of manslaughter once again. So the law was enforced once again. And according to the new law, what happened? The armies of Pharaoh started killing baby boys and imprisoned anyone who would try to protest against this. So the genocide started once again. And Musa salam, he was a prophet. He was saddened to see the persecution around him, but he couldn't do anything but pray, right? He was helpless. He couldn't interfere, nor did he have the power to stop this genocide. So that's the reason why, what did he do? He advised Bani Israel to be patient, to be patient. Indeed, the help of Allah will come. So remember, sabr and dua doesn't mean that instantaneously all our problems are gonna go away. There's a reason why we are tested so that we can learn to put our trust on Allah so that we can learn to remove ourselves from all the distractions of life and talk to Allah sincerely in solitude so that we can learn to be patient. So yes, it takes time. It takes time. When we make dua, when we seek the help of Allah, the problems do not go away instantaneously. The Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba, they suffered for 13 years in Mecca but they were forbidden to retaliate. They were not allowed to take revenge. Why so? Because Allah was preparing them. Through all these hardships, Allah was building their iman and strengthening it. And when Allah knew that they already, subhanAllah, the help of Allah came and they were eventually victorious. SubhanAllah, we all can see that when COVID-19 actually struck. On the onset of COVID-19, we were all disturbed. We were all buried. We were all stressed out. But what happened as a result of it? We all resorted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all resorted to salah. We all resorted to dua. We sought the help of Allah, right? So even in this, in this calamity, there was a benefit for us. Right? There was shifa for us, for our dead hearts, for our rested hearts. The hearts were the hearts which were distracted with dunya. 
which were distracted away from deen, from the dhikr of Allah. There was cure and shifa for those dead hearts. So alhamdulillah, even in that calamity was ease, was khair for us. I number 130, and indeed we punished the people of Fir'aun with years of drought and shortness of fruits that they might remember and take heed. So what happened that when these people, the oppressors, they started inflicting punishment upon punishment on the Israelites, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished the people of Fir'aun as well with years of drought and shortness of fruits. So they started killing the children, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started healing their crops. So they would have shortness of crops. And that tells us that each action that we perform, it has a consequence with it. It has a consequence with it. There is no leeway to that. But whenever good came to them, they said, ours is this. And if evil afflicted them, they ascribed it to evil omens connected with Moses and those with him. Be informed, verily, their evil omens are with Allah, but most of them do not know. So Musa alayhi salam went to Fir'aun and demanded to release the children of Israel, stop this persecution and free them, but Fir'aun did not comply. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished him by destroying his crops and fruits. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whenever they would have good harvest, the Egyptians would claim that all this produce is because of their booming economy. It is because of their own hard work. But if they would come across any loss, like, for example, the shortness of fruits and crops, they would immediately blame Musa alayhi salam for it. They would say, he's the one who's bringing all this bad luck for us. He's the culprit behind our downfall. So even today, subhanAllah, we do this as well. And that's the reason why all these stories are mentioned, right? Because we can actually relate to them. They are like a mirror for us so that we can see our own reflection. That's exactly what we do. Whenever there is any success, we take full credit. That I'm a very good citizen, alhamdulillah. I'm an excellent employee at work. That's why I succeed. I work very hard. But when there's any downfall, right? What do we do? We say, yeah, there's so much corruption going on, right? in the country. There's so much politics in my company, in my community. That's the reason why I fail. We put the entire blame on the government. We put the entire blame on the authority officials, right? You would often complain that if the government provides financial aid to the poor, poverty will be eliminated. Yes, that's true. But we forget to ask ourselves, when was the last time we helped a poor person? When was the last time we bought someone groceries? We purchased groceries for them. So yes, it's very easy to mention all the problems and blame other people. It's a good discussion. We love to gossip, right? But we should also think about ways how we can contribute towards providing a solution as well, becoming a solution as well contributing towards a solution as well. Inshallah, I number 132, they said to Musa, whatever ayat you may bring to us to work there with your sorcery on us, we shall never believe in you. So we sent on them the flood, the locusts, the lice, the frogs, and the blood, manifest signs, yet they remained arrogant. And they were, those, they were of those people who were criminals. And when the punishment fell on them, they said, O oh Moses, invoke your Lord for us because of his promise to you. If you remove the punishment from us, we indeed shall believe in you, and we shall let the children of Israel go with you. But when we remove the punishment from them to a fixed term, which they had to reach, behold, they broke their word. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them in different ways. Punished who? The Egyptians, the people of Pharaoh. And each time a punishment would come, it would come for a grace period so that they can learn their lesson and repent. So different punishments were sent to them 
for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Allah sent Tufan on them, right? Followed by locusts. Like everywhere, there would be locusts. Another azab that was sent upon them were frogs. They would have frogs in their houses, pans, pots. Anytime they would go to drink, um, there would be a frog sitting in the glass. So it was a kind of adab for them. But subhanAllah, even though different types of punishments were sent to them, whenever a punishment would come, they would ask Musa alayhi salam to make dua, promising him that if the calamity would be removed, then we will believe in your religion. And we will also comply by your request and free the children of Israel. But each time Musa alayhi salam would make dua and the affliction was removed from them, they would go back on their old ways. They would break their promise. So Allah says, so we took retribution from them. We drowned them in the sea because they denied our ayat and they were heedless about them. So many signs came to them, but after witnessing all these signs yet, they forgot Allah. They broke their promise. And the reason why they did this, Allah mentions to us because they were ghafil. They were heedless. What is ghafla? Ghafla is an Arabic word for heedlessness, which means the sin of forgetting Allah and the purpose behind one's existence. We all confess that we were ghafil at one point of time, right? We were so engrossed in seeking worldly pleasures that we never had time to pray. We were so preoccupied with our family and kids that we would purposefully delay Hajj despite having the ability to afford it, right? And that's the reason why Allah mentions all these stories to us so that we can realize how detrimental the state of ghafla can be. This ayah teaches us that because Fir'aun and his people continue to be in a state of ghafla, in a state of heedlessness and ignored all the signs that were sent to them, they were eventually destroyed. They drowned. Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our iman and keep us steadfast on it. Amen. And we made the people who were considered weak to inherit the eastern parts of the land and the western parts thereof, which we have blessed. And the fair word of your Lord was fulfilled for the children of Israel because of their endurance. And we destroyed completely all the great works and buildings which Pharaoh and his people erected. So who inherited the land after them? Bani Israel. Initially, Bani Israel felt utterly defeated, right? They were speaking to Musa alayhi salam as if they were a defeated nation. But yet, because they were patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded them with success. And they inherited the land. And this is the land of present day Palestine, Palestine. So it's true. It's true that when we are patient, that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help definitely arrives but it takes time. It takes time and we have to be patient because even in that patience is reward for us. Allah is teaching us something. I number 138, and we brought the children of Israel with safety across the sea and they came upon a people devoted to some of their idols in worship. They said, oh Moses, make for us a ilah, a God, as they have gods. He said, verily you are a people who know not. SubhanAllah, this is jahala, right? That they have seen the sea split apart for them. They were safely moved from one part of the land to the other. Allah granted them freedom from slavery. Yet, SubhanAllah, idol worship was in their system. They were so used to it that once they passed by a town of people, who are practicing idol worship, they asked Musa alayhi salam that, Ya Musa, give us an idol as well. Make for us an idol as well so that we can worship him. SubhanAllah. They just destroyed the complete motif of Tawheed, right? So what did Musa alayhi salam respond? He said, Inna kum qawmun tajhalun. You are people who are ignorant. 
And what is jahal? Jahal literally is emotional thinking because aqal is controlling emotions and then thinking. So when we do not think with our aqal, what do we do? We are doing jahal. We are thinking emotionally. Musa alayhi salam added, verily these people will be destroyed for that which they are engaged in, meaning idol worship, and all that they are doing is in vain. He said, shall I seek for you a God other than Allah? Well, he has given you superiority over the alami, meaning how foolish is this question even to have an idol when Allah is the one who helped you throughout. Allah is the one who granted you freedom from Fir'aun. So why would you even ask that question? Why would you even request this? And remember when we rescued you from Fir'aun, who were afflicting you with the worst torment, killing your sons and letting your women live. And in that was a great trial from your Lord. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning all the blessings that were given to them so that they can realize the favor of Allah, the blessing of Allah upon them. And we appointed for Musa 30 nights and added to the period 10 more, and he completed the term, appointed by his Lord of 40 nights. And Musa said to his brother Harun, replace me among my people, act in the right way by ordering the people to obey Allah and to worship him and follow not the way of mischief makers. So what happened when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Musa alayhi salam, to grant him the Torah, to give him Torah, Musa alayhi salam made his brother Harun alayhi salam as an in charge. So again, this is the rule of thumb as well, that if we are not able to do a task because we have that something else to do, because we are moving away for a certain time, whatever it may be, if we are unable to fulfill a task, it's our responsibility to create, to have a substitute in our place so that the task keeps going on. So say, for instance, if you are teaching and because you got sick and you're not able to do that task anymore, you should appoint a substitute. You should teach that task to someone so that the journey continues and you continue to gain sadaqa jariya from that person. Say, for instance, you are a member of the education committee in the masjid. Again, if you are moving away to a certain place, you appoint someone else to do that task on your behalf so that even though you're not living in that country anymore, you still continue to get that reward. SubhanAllah. So even in this story, there's a beautiful lesson for us so that we can improve our akhirah. We can gain benefits in our grave even after we are long gone. That's the benefit of teaching others. So what happened when Musa alayhi salam left? After making Harun alayhi salam in charge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when Musa came at the time and place appointed by us, and his Lord Allah spoke to him. He said, oh, my Lord, show me yourself. Meaning Musa alayhi salam really wanted to see Allah. He said, so that I may look upon you. Allah said, you cannot see me, but look upon the mountain. If it stands still in its place, then you shall see me. So Musa alayhi salam said, ya Allah, allow me one glance. Ra'a, allow me one glance. So that I may do nadara. And nadara means to stare. So that I may stare at you, Ya Allah. So that I may continue to look at you. Allah said, you cannot even have a single ra'a at me. You cannot even have a single ra'a of me. Rather, what should you do? You should stare at the mountain. So when his Lord appeared to the mountain, he made it collapse to dust. And Moses fell down unconscious. Then when he recovered his senses, he said, glorified are you, subhanak, glorified are you. I turn to you in repentance and I am the first of the believers. And that's the nature of the matter. When you love someone a lot, you want to see them. You want to keep talking to them, whether it's your parents, your spouse, your siblings. When you meet them after a very, very long time, Many years have passed, you feel that you have, the, you, you have more urge to spend time with them, to spend time with them, right? 
many a times people do all sorts of zikr, turud, hoping that they can see the Prophet ﷺ in their dream. Why? Again, due to the love of the Prophet ﷺ, which resides in their heart. So again, whether we will see the Prophet ﷺ in our dream or not, the crux of the matter is we want to see him on the day of Qiyamah in a state that he is pleased with us. We want to meet him in Jannah and have his companionship. We want to have the glimpse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah because in dunya, it's not real. It's not true. It's not possible. And in order to do that, in order to have that blessing, this is the Quran that we need to study and spend time with and follow it so that we can have that blessing of seeing Allah that day in Jannah, inshallah. Allah said, O Moses, I have chosen you above men by my messages and by my speaking to you. So hold that which I have given you and be one of the grateful ones. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to Musa alayhi salam, inni stafaytuka ala nasi bi risalati wa bi kalam. I have chosen you above everyone. How? So because I have spoken to you. So Musa alayhi salam, the most special thing, the special honor because of which Musa alayhi salam is exonerated is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke directly to him. And that was also a blessing granted to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke directly with him. So this was indeed an honor. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَخُذْ مَا آتَيْتُكَ بَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ How can you be grateful to me? By holding on to my book. And if we want to be grateful abd, grateful shakir, people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grateful abd, slaves to Allah, then we need to do what? We need to hold on to this book, this blessing, the blessing of Quran, the blessing of Hidayah. I number 145, and we, wrote, and we wrote for him on the tablets, the lesson to be drawn from all things and the explanation for all things and said, hold to these with firmness and enjoin your people to take the better therein. I shall show you the home of the rebellious. I shall turn away from my ayat those who behave arrogantly on the earth without a right, and even if they see all ayat, they will not believe in them. And if they see the way of righteousness, they will not adopt it as the way. But if they see the way of error, they will adopt that way. That is because they have rejected our ayat and were heedless to learn a lesson from them. And that's the case with the people who have kufr ingrained in their hearts. Just like if we see the example of Abu Jahal. Abu Jahal knew very well that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is on the right path. He is indeed the Prophet of Allah. But what came into his way of Hidayah? Jealousy and pride. Jealousy and pride. Because he did not wish to see the tribe of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going ahead than his tribe. So he rejected. And that's the danger of pride. That's the danger of pride because it prevents us from gaining hidayah. So we should hold on to humility and act according to the ayat of Quran because Allah says, those who deny our ayat and the meeting in the hereafter, when are their deeds? Are they requited with anything except what they used to do? And the people of Moses made in his absence out of their ornaments, the image of a calf for worship. It had a sound as if it was mooing. Did they not see that it could neither speak to them nor guide them to the way? They took it for worship and they were wrongdoers. SubhanAllah. This is actually utter jahala, right? They asked Musa salam, initially, if you can create an idol for us, Musa salam, already refused their request, explained to them why this is not allowed, why this request has been denied, yet, yet, subhanAllah, when Musa salam, is not present during his absence, they fulfill their desire. They create a calf in order to worship it. 
SubhanAllah, this is ignorance. This is jihada. I number 149, and when they regretted and saw that they had gone astray, they repented and said, if our Lord have not mercy upon us and forgive us, we shall certainly be off the losers. So after doing that mistake, after committing that sin, they acknowledge the fact that they have sinned. They have committed an error. So what did they do? They asked Allah to forgive them. They asked Allah for repentance. And when Moses returned to his people, angry and grieved, he said, what an evil thing is that which you have done, worshipping the cat during my absence? Did you hasten and go ahead as regards the matter of your Lord? Meaning you left his worship? So he threw down his tablets, meaning he was enraged, and seized his brother by the hair of his head and dragged him towards him. Harun alayhi salam said, O oh, son of my mother, indeed the people judged me weak and were about to kill me. So make not the enemies rejoice over me, nor put me amongst the people who are wrongdoers. So when Musa alayhi salam came, he felt extremely upset to see that Harun alayhi salam was not able to fulfill the task he appointed him for. Right? He was upset. Because he had certain expectations from Harun alayhi salam and he felt that he was not able to comply by them. So Harun alayhi salam gave his explanation. He said, the people judged me weak and they were about to kill me. That's the reason why I was not able to correct them. That's how much they empowered me. So now when the correct explanation was given to Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam said, oh my Lord, forgive me and my brother and admit us into your mercy for you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. So what do we learn from here? At times when we're very angry, when we're very upset at someone without even listening to their point of view, we start yelling at them. We start shouting at them and we start judging them. Despite the fact that we do not even know the reality, we don't even know what went wrong behind the scenes, right? So we should always give a chance to let the person explain themselves, to let the person explain themselves so that the reality can be presented. And then after listening to the person, after listening to both the groups who were in dispute, then we can give our decision then we can make the final decision. And this is the correct way to adopt. Certainly those who took the calf for worship, wrath from their Lord and humiliation will come upon them in the life of this world. Thus do we recompense those who invent lies. So after realizing his mistake, Musa alayhi salam made dua to Allah and asked forgiveness for himself and his brother. But those who committed evil deeds and then repented afterwards and believed verily your Lord, after all that is indeed oft forgiving, most merciful. So we see even in the people who created the calf and started worshiping, there were two set of people. There were people who repented, so they were saved. Allah forgave them. But then there were people who did not repent for their sin, so humiliation was cast upon them. And when the anger of Musa calmed down, he took up the tablets and in their inscription was guidance and mercy for those who fear their Lord. So anger is basically from shaitan, from Iblis. Why? Because he is made up of fire. And anger is something which makes our blood pressure boil, right? So how can we cool our anger down? Who can we, how can we cool our anger down? By doing what? By holding on to the tablets. Tablets meaning what? By holding on to the Quran. If we read the Quran, we study Quran, we spend time with the Quran, then what happens? Quran gives us tranquility. Quran calms down a person. Quran gives us glad tidings about Jannah. So when we are angry, we should look at the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as mentioned by his wife Aisha, he was a walking, talking Quran. He was the perfect embodiment of Quran. 
So how did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would confound his anger? Number one, he would say, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim He would seek help in Allah against shaytan. Number two, what else we can do if we feel mad, if we feel angry? Drink water. If we are uh, standing up, we should sit down. If we are sitting, then we should lay down. What else? Doing wudu. Because water extinguishes fire, right? So doing wudu really helps. And lastly, be silent. Be silent because silence is better than uttering something which would cause more harm. SubhanAllah. So again, the cure for anything, even for anger, comes from Quran and Sunnah, inshallah. So let us adopt these ways and inshallah, we will be successful. And Moses chose out of his people 70 of the best men for our appointed time and place of meeting. And when they were seized with a violent earthquake, he said, oh my Lord, if it had been your own will, you could have destroyed them and me before. Would you destroy us for the deeds of the foolish ones amongst us? It is only your trial by which you lead astray whom you will and keep guided whom you will. You are our wali, so forgive us and have mercy on us for you are the best of those who forgive. So what happened after the Israelites were left with Harun alayhi salam, while Musa alayhi salam went to um, receive Torah, they started worshiping the calf and they were commanded that the expiation of this sin will be that the innocent ones should kill the sinners. The innocent ones should kill the idol worshipers. After they did that, they were repentant. This was their expiation for their sin. However, 70 pious men amongst them wanted to repent to Allah directly. So Moses took them to Mount Tur. He asked them to wait while he went to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the high elevation of a mountain. Then when he returned back to them, instead of apologizing to Allah, instead of repenting to Allah, seeking istighfar, what did they do? They said to Musa alayhi salam, we will only believe if we see Allah with our own eyes, subhanAllah, what blasphemous action was this, right? What a blasphemy. They asked Musa alayhi salam that we would only believe if we see Allah with our very eyes. And this was a huge demand because even Musa alayhi salam couldn't see Allah. Then how could these people, no matter how much righteous they are, how can they see Allah? So what happened? Because of this demand, the ground shook. And the 70 people who came along with Musa alayhi salam were struck with a lightning bolt and they fell down dead. They fell down dead. And that's when Musa alayhi salam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise them up, to resurrect them. Why so? Because these were the best people of his ummah. So he said, Ya Allah, if they are destroyed, then who would worship you? These are the best of men. So what did Allah do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted this dua and resurrected them back. I number 156. And ordained for us good in this world and in the hereafter. Certainly we have turned to you. He said, as to my punishment, I afflict therewith whom I will and my mercy embraces all things. That mercy I shall ordain for those who are the pious and give zakah and those who believe in our ayat. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet, who can neither read nor write, whom they find written with them in the Torah and in Jeel, with them, he commands them for maruf, to do good, and forbids them from munkar, against sins. He allows them as lawful at tayyibat all that is good and pure, and prohibits them as unlawful al khabaith all that is evil and unlawful. He releases them from their heavy burdens and from the fetters, bindings that were upon them. So those who believe in him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa honor him, help him, and follow the light, the Qur'an, which has been sent down with him. It is they who will be the successful ones. SubhanAllah. So it's a beautiful ayah, a long ayah, but a very beautiful ayah in which we learn 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word isr. Isr means heavy loads of bricks and construction, things that people used to carry on their backs as slaves. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about aghnan, the chains that people used to drag heavy material. And the slaves at the time of Fir'aun would do that, right? Because there were no machines. So it was all manpower. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the purpose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to people. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to guide us was for the fact that he can teach us the right and the wrong, the halal and the haram, and also so that he can release us from the heavy burdens that we have, the isr, the aglal that we are in. He can release us from them. And subhanAllah, when you look at the ayah, we realize that Islam is such an easy deen. We have adopted so many isr around us, so many aglal around us. SubhanAllah, if you look at the marriages, lavish marriages that are taking place right now, it puts a heavy burden on a person who's poor, who cannot afford all this, right? It puts a heavy burden on them. But what does Islam teaches us? What does Quran teaches us? That marriages need to be simple. The best of marriage is one which is simple and the one in which the poor are invited. And if we truly follow that sunnah, we can make our life so easy. So easy, right? SubhanAllah. We learn from the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, serve the guests, whatever there may be, right? Even if it is just a few days, serve the guests, whatever they may be. And SubhanAllah, we make our lives difficult by making so much variety, by cooking so much and then we complain. Again, subhanAllah, Islam is very easy. And the Prophet ﷺ came to us to make our life easy. To make our life easy. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors a person if he serves his guest well. But then, subhanAllah, we shouldn't go to an extreme that we spend all our money to serve people 50 varieties, right? We shouldn't go to that extreme that we spend so much money on our gatherings, on our marriages, on our parties, just because we want to impress other people. So Islam is an easy religion. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to us to take us out from all this isr that we are involved in, from all this aghlal that we are involved in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us that what should we do as a return? We should do azaruhu. And ta'zi literally means to respect someone so much that we go out of our way to help them out. So for example, when a teacher walks in, the student just takes his back. He takes his phone. He takes the glass, the mug that he's holding. He goes out of his way to help his teacher, right? Or when a parent comes home, that's how the children greet them. That's al saruhu right? And that's how the ummah, the sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave him respect, honored him, right? Even though Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not, is, is not present with us anymore. He's not amongst us anymore. Yet, we can give him isa. Right? Yet we can do azaruhu wa nasaruhu wa taba'un nur. By doing what? By following his sunnah. By doing what? By reciting the durud. By doing what? Studying his seerah. By doing what? Conveying his theme, conveying his legacy. So the decision is ours. The ball is on our court. How can we help this team? How can we honor our Prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I number 158, say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O mankind, verily I am sent to you all as a messenger of Allah, to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. La ilaha illahu. It is he who gives life and causes death. So believe in Allah and his messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write, who believes in Allah and his words. Follow him so that you may be guided. 
And of the people of Moses, there is a community who lead the men with truth and establish justice therewith. Meaning there are amongst the people of Musa salam, amongst the Bani Israel, people who are good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is complimenting them. And we divided them into 12 tribes as distinct nations. We revealed to Musa when his people asked him for water, saying, strike the stone with your stick. And there gushed forth out of it 12 springs. Each root knew its own place for water. We shaded them with the clouds and sent down upon them Alman and Salwa, saying, eat of the good things that which we have provided you. They harmed us not, but they used to harm themselves. So again, the scene is being sketched about the time when Musa salam's people, Bani Israel, they crossed the Red Sea. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with ready-made food from the heavens because they had left their homes, their real estate, their, their money, their wealth, everything in Egypt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established them with new blessings in this new land. So what happened? Each nation, each tribe was given a spring so that they do not have discord among them. They do not dispute amongst them. So 12 springs gushed forth, each one for each tribe. And they were given ready-made food so that they can be grateful and they can thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing. And remember when it was said to them, dwell in this town, Jerusalem, and eat there from whatever, wherever you wish. And say, Ya Allah, forgive our sins. وَقُولُوا hittatun, And enter the great prostrating and we shall forgive you your wrongdoings and we shall increase the reward for the good doers so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Bani Israel that you can settle in Jerusalem in this new land in this holy land and we all know that Jerusalem is known as it is one of the blessed lands on earth why because a lot of prophets came onto this land so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished something good for them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Bani Israel to enter this land saying hittatun. But what happened? But those among them who did wrong changed the word. They made the word hittatun to hintatun. They changed the word that had been told to them. So we sent on them a torment from, their, from the heaven in return for their wrongdoings. So despite receiving all men and salva, despite receiving so many blessings, yet when they showed mockery towards the ayat of Allah, they were punished. And asked them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the town that was by the sea. When they transgressed in the matter of Sabbath, when their fish came to them openly on the Sabbath day and did not come to them on the day they had no Sabbath, thus we made a trial of them, for they used to rebel against the commands of Allah. And when a community among them said, why do you preach to a people whom Allah is about to destroy or to punish with a severe torment? The preacher said, in order to be free from guilt before your Lord, and perhaps they may fear Allah. So when they forgot the remindings that had been given to them, we rescued those who forbade evil, but with a severe torment, we seized those who did wrong because they used to rebel against the ayat of Allah. So when they exceeded the limits of what they were prohibited, we said to them, be you monkeys despised and rejected. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning to us the story of the people of who broke the rule of Sabbath. Sabbath was known to be a holy day for them in which they were not supposed to work. They were not allowed to work. And when Israel got divided into three groups in terms of that. One group admonished the sinners while the other group remained silent. And the third group were the sinners, in fact, the ones who would try to catch the fish despite the fact that they were prohibited to do so. So what happened as a result of this disobedience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the group who admonished the sinners. However, the other group who was passive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention anything about it. The ones who did not indulge in sin and the ones who did not, who did not even prohibit others to do so. 
The other group who was passive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention about them. So the people who were transformed into monkeys were those who indulged in the sin. So what do we learn from here? That number one, we should never exceed the commands of Allah. We should not never transgress the commands against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, we also learn that it is not sufficient for us as Muslims to save ourselves from sin only, right? A preacher should also warn others about sins and their consequences. Whether or not our efforts bring fruits to us, it doesn't matter. Because we see from so many stories of the prophets, many prophets had multiple followers and some did not even have one. So it doesn't matter whether our preaching brings fruits or not. It bears fruit or not. We should keep telling people about the correct things, the right things, about halal and haram. We should preach others. We should teach others. We should educate them. And we should never lose hope in the audience because we never know. One person out of them may be guided, may be guided. And remember when your Lord declared that he would certainly keep on sending against them, the Jews, till the day of resurrection, those who would afflict them with the humiliating torment. Verily, your Lord is quick in retribution, and certainly he is oft forgiving, most merciful. And we have broken them, the Jews, up into various separate groups on the earth. Some of them are righteous and some are away from that. And we tested them with good blessings and evil calamities in order that they might turn into the obedience to Allah. Then after them succeeded an evil generation which inherited the book, but they chose for themselves the good of this low life, evil pleasures of this world, saying as an excuse that everything will be forgiven to us. And if again the offer of the like came their way, they would again seize them meaning they would again commit those sins. Was not the covenant of the book taken from them that they would not say about Allah anything but the truth? And they have studied what is in it, the book, and the home of hereafter is better for those who have taqwa. Do you not then understand? And as to those who hold fast to the book and perform salah, certainly we shall never waste the reward of those who do righteous deeds, meaning holding on to the book is mentioned with salah. Both of them are equally important. We cannot just stick to performing salah and ignore the book altogether and only recite it during the month of Ramadan only, recite Surat Kahf only on the day of Jum'ah only. Rather, what are we told to do? Hold on to the book, meaning stick to the book, study it and benefit from it every single day. And remember when we raised the mountain over them as if it had been a canopy and they thought that it was going to fall on them. We said, hold firmly to what we have given you and remember that which is therein so that you may fear Allah and obey him. So over here again, subhanAllah, another incident is mentioned to us that after the 70 men returned from Mount Tur, okay, so they went with Musa alayhi salam. They made the claim. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shook the mountain. Musa alayhi salam made dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected them back again. Now another scene is mentioned. When these 70 men returned from Mount Tur with Musa alayhi salam, they went to the Israelites and they said, Allah has commanded injunctions in this book. However, you only need to follow what you can because you will be forgiven for whatever you cannot do. And again, this is blasphemy, right? They added a condition for obedience. They added a condition for obedience that follow whatever you can, whatever you wish, whatever is easy for you, but it's okay to let go whatever is hard, whatever is difficult. So because of their sin, Allah ordered Mount Tur to be raised above their heads and ordered them that if you accept the entire book and all the orders of Allah, then that should be in. Otherwise, the mountain is going to fall on top of you and crush you. So basically, a threat was given to them 
and that's how they complied. That's how they sought repentance. And remember when your Lord brought forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their seeds, and made them testify as to themselves, saying, Am I not your Rabb? They said, yes, we testify, lest he should say on the day of resurrection, verily, we have been unaware of this. Or lest he should say, it was only our fathers aforetime who took others as partners in worship along with Allah, and we were merely their descendants after them. Will you then, dis then destroy us because of the deeds of men who practiced batil, who committed crimes? Thus do we explain the ayat in detail so that they may return to the truth. And this ayah number 172 is mentioning about wade alast. And this was a promise taken from all of us when we were in alam al-arwah. When we were not even born, that's when all of us were taken this promise to only worship Allah and not associate any partners with him. And all of us affirmed to this promise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are taking this promise from you so that on the day of judgment, you do not claim that we were unaware of this. So our ruh is already in tune with this promise. The promise to do what? The promise to worship one God. The promise not to associate any partners with him. Our ruh is already in tune with this promise. Our ruh is already used to this promise. So if we transgress and if we break this promise, then who do we harm? We harm our own selves. We harm our own akhirah. And recite, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to them the story of him to whom we gave our ayat, but he threw them away. So shaitan followed him up and he became of those who went astray. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an analogy of a person who was given the ayat meaning that he was a person who studied the book of Allah, who recited the book of Allah day and night. He taught, he preached, he teached. He educated himself. But soon after, something went into him. Shaitan misled him and he left everything. He stopped praying salah. He stopped studying Quran. He stopped spending time in dhikr. He stopped following Allah altogether. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those are the strategy, strategies of shaitan. And that can happen with any one of us. It can happen with a person from the masses who doesn't have any knowledge of deen. And it can even happen to an imam. It can even happen to a hafiz of Quran. It can happen with anyone. So we should never feel that we are not vulnerable to the acts, to the strategies of shaitan, to the tricks of shaitan. We should always keep seeking the help of Allah against shaitan. And had we built, we would surely have elevated him therewith, but he clung to the earth and followed his own vain desire. So his parable is the parable of a dog. If you drive him away, he lolls his tongue out. Or he, or, he lolls his tongue out, or if you leave him alone, he still lolls his tongue out. Such is the parable of the people who reject our ayat. So relate the stories, perhaps they may reflect. Evil is the parable of the people who rejected our ayat and used to wrong their own selves. Whosoever Allah guides, he is the guided one. And whosoever he sends astray, then those, they are the losers. And surely we have created many of the jinn and mankind for hell. They have hearts therewith they understand not, and they have eyes wherewith they see not, and they have ears wherewith they hear not the truth. They are like cattle, no, even more astray. Those, they are the heedless ones. So the people who do not benefit from their intellect, and their intellect does not help them to seek Allah, to worship Allah, then Allah compares them to an'am, to cattle. Because what's the purpose of life for them? Eat, sleep, and release, right? Release the waste. That's their whole agenda of life. That's their, whole, their entire purpose of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bal Rather, they're even more astray than them. They're even more worse than animals. 
They are in ghafla. May Allah protect us. And all the most beautiful names belong to Allah. So call on him by them and leave the company of those who belie or deny his names. They will be requited for what they used to do. So what should we do when we make dua? We should call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his asma'ul husna, with his names, with his sifat. And that is encouraged in making dua. So when we ask for forgiveness, for instance, we can say, Ya Allah, Ya Tawab, please have, grant me forgiveness. Ya Rahman, please have mercy on us. Ya Wadud, enable me to attain your love. So using the names of Allah and making dua, subhanAllah, grants us high chances of acceptance of that dua. And of those whom we have created, there is a community who guides others with the truth and establishes justice therewith. Those who reject our ayat, we shall gradually seize them with punishment in ways they perceive not. And I respite them, certainly my plot is strong. Do they not reflect? There is no madness in their companion, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He is but a plain warner. Do they not look in the dominion of the heavens and the earth and all things that Allah has created and that it may be that the end of their lives is near? In what message after this will they then believe? Whomsoever Allah sends astray, none can guide him and he lets them wander blindly in their transgressions. They ask you about the hour, about the day of resurrection. When will be its appointed time? Say the knowledge thereof is with my Lord alone. None can reveal its time but he. Heavy is its burden through the heavens and the earth. It shall not come upon you except all of you a sudden. They ask you as if you have a good knowledge of it. Say the knowledge thereof is with Allah alone. But most of mankind know not. So because Surah Araf is a Makki Surah, a lot of people in Mecca would come to the Prophet وسلم, and would ask him about the Day of Judgment. When is its appointed time? When is it coming? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet وسلم, to say, Allah. The knowledge of it is known only to Allah. No one knows about it. So there's no point to this question. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I possess no power over benefit or harm to myself, except Allah wills, except as Allah wills. If I had the knowledge of the unseen, I should have secured for myself an abundance of wealth, and no evil should have touched me. I am but a warner and a bringer of glad tidings to a people who believe. It is he who has created you from a single person, and then he has created from him his wife, Hawa in order that he might enjoy the pleasure of living with her. When he covers her by himself, she becomes pregnant and she carries it about lightly. Then when it became heavy, they both invoked Allah, their Lord saying, if you give a salih good child, we shall indeed be amongst the grateful ones. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us an example of a couple just like Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam, both of them had children, just like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an analogy to us of a couple who wanted to have children. So they invoked Allah, they made dua to Allah, and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with a child, what happened? Allah says, but when he gave them a salih child, good in every aspect, a healthy child, they ascribed partners to Allah in that which he has given to them. High is Allah, exalted above all that they ascribe as partners to him. So instead of thanking Allah for the child, they started attributing partners to Allah. And it's because of so and so, such and such a saint. It's because of his blessings, I got this child. Rather than giving the credit to Allah, they start attributing partners. So Allah says, do they attribute as partners to Allah those who created nothing, but they themselves are created? No help can they give them, nor can they help themselves. To many people who do grave worship, they make dua at the grave and they think that the saint within that grave has actually helped them out, has actually fulfilled their request, has actually fulfilled their dua. So Allah says, they cannot help themselves. How can they help you? And if you call them to guidance, they follow you not. 
It is the same for you, whether you call them or you keep silent. Verily, those whom you call upon, besides Allah, are slaves like you. So call upon them and let them answer you if you are truthful. Have they feet therewith to walk? Or have they hands wherewith they hold? Or have they eyes wherewith they see? Or have they ears wherewith they hear? Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa call your so-called partners of Allah and then plot against me and give me no respite. And these ayat are mentioned over here. Why? Because the polities of Mecca would have different idols for different tasks. So if they want to drain, they would go to a specific idol. If they would want to have a child, they would go to a specific idol and make a dua to it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a rhetorical question that do they have feet? They're not even to walk. They're not able to walk. Do they have eyes to see that you're making dua to them? Do they have ears so that they can hear? How is it that? How is it even possible that an idol, a lifeless idol that you created with your own hands can grant you your request? It's not possible. So Allah tells the Prophet to say, Verily, my wali, my protector is Allah, who has revealed the book, this Quran, and he protects the ones who are righteous. If you truly want to seek the help of Allah, then worship him, because he helps the people who are righteous, who worships him. And those whom you call upon besides Allah cannot help you, nor can they help themselves. And if you call them to guidance, they hear not. And you will see them looking at you, yet they see not. Show forgiveness, enjoin what is good, and turn away from the foolish. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, عرف, We should hold on to forgiveness because many a times people say things that hurts. They do things which hurt. So we should hold on to forgiveness because ihsan brings about good. Enjoin what is good. So teach them, educate them what is right. What is halal to do? What is the good thing to do? And then turn away from the foolish ones. Yet there will be ignorant people who will not understand. Who will not understand. They will not listen to you. So what do you do? Ignore them. Ignore them. Do not be harsh on them. And if an evil whisper comes to you from shaitan, then seek refuge with Allah. Verily, he is the all-hearer and all-knower. So anytime we are enticed by shaitan to do something wrong, to do something evil, whether it is to watch something evil on the TV, whether it is to click something on social media, whether it is to say something which involves gossip, which involves riba, or whether it is to commit an act which is evil, such as zina. What should we do? As soon as this evil whisper comes to us, we should say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Seek help in Allah against Shaitan. Verily, those who are Al Muttaqeen, the people who have taqwa, when an evil thought comes to them from Shaitan, they remember Allah, and indeed, they then see a right. Meaning, when we are about to slip, when we're about to mess up, that's exactly when we should remember Allah. We should do dhikr. We should make dua to Allah. And then Allah will guide us. But as for their brothers, the devils, they, the devils, plunge them deeper into error and they never stop short. And if you do not bring them a miracle according to their proposal, meaning the request of the Quraysh pagans, they say, why have you not brought it? So the people of Mecca, they would make different requests to the Prophet wasallam to give them wealth, to give them, uh, to show them a miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet to say, I but follow what is revealed to me from my Lord. This the Quran is nothing but evidences from your Lord and a guidance and a mercy for a people who believe. Meaning, you want miracles? This Quran itself is the biggest miracle ever. Read it, study it, and you will be guided. So when the Quran is recited, listen to it and be silent, that you may receive mercy. So that you may receive mercy. So again, this is something that we need to apply as well, that when the Quran is being recited, we should pay attention to it. We should listen to it. It shouldn't be the fact that the Quran is running and being played and we're busy doing our chores and we're not paying attention. 
So we should be silent and we should listen to it. Many a times people, they when they move on to their new home, when they purchase a new home, what do they do? They put on Surat Baqarah, they play Surat Baqarah and what's going on? The recitation is being played and there's no one who's listening to them, right? We're busy unpacking, doing our work, doing our chores and the Quran is being played. What huge disrespect, right? The best thing to do is that we should recite ourselves. But if you think that your speed is too slow, your tajweed is not good, you're not able to complete the entire surah because it's too long, then what should we do? We should play the recitation and listen ourselves as well. Pay attention to it as well. Open a word-to-word -word translation Quran and move your finger along with the translation so that we may understand what's going on, what's being recited. Because Quran is here for our hidayah. It's not simply a book to be recited and put on top of the shelf. It's a book for guidance. So we need to open it, study it, and seek the blessings of Quran by understanding it, by following it, and applying the lessons of it, inshallah. That is the haqq of Quran that is due on us. And remember your Lord within yourself, humbly and with fear, and with loudness in words in the mornings and in the afternoons, and be not, be not of those who are neglectful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the etiquette of calling Ara, how should we call him? The daru'an within ourselves, secretly. وَخِيفَةً within ourselves, humbly. وَدُونَ الْجَهْرِ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ and without loudness, without disrespect. And when should we call upon our Rabb? بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْأَسَانِ in mornings and afternoons, meaning throughout the day. وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ and we should not be from those who are heedless, meaning we should never ignore the Qur'an. We should never set aside the Qur'an. We should never stay aloof from the Qur'an. Even it may be that we are on our period and we don't have to recite Qur'an still. We should stay connected with it. We can listen to tafsir. We can play a lecture. We can study the translation. There are different ways, but we should stay connected with the Qur'an because we never know when our time is up, when we see the Malikul Maut and we have to face Allah. So it's not worth it to stay away from the Quran for that long. We should remember Allah mornings and afternoons, throughout the day in as many forms as we can, through zikr, through Quran, through salah, through dua, inshallah. And now the month of Ramadan is coming up. We have multiple opportunities to do that, inshallah. So let us use the best of Ramadan so that inshallah we can have a fruitful and productive Ramadan, inshallah. Last ayah of Surat Araf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely those who are with your Lord, the angels, are never too proud to perform acts of worship to him, but they glorify his praise and prostrate themselves before him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the malaika that they are not La yastakbirun. They do not have kibr in them. Kibr actually means pride. And that is the inner characteristic that a person feels, which is pride. When kibr, the inner characteristic, is portrayed in our actions, it becomes arrogance, takabbur. And both these things are discouraged in Islam. What did Iblis have? Iblis had kibbutz, pride in his heart, and he portrayed that in his action by not obeying the command of Allah, by not bowing down to Adam alayhi salam. So then his kibbutz became takabbur because his inner characteristic portrayed through his action. So we need to ask ourselves, do we want to be like Iblis? Or do we want to be like the malaika about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, la yastakbirun. They do not have the slightest kibr. And what do they do? They glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yusabbihunahu wa lahu yasjudun. And they prostrate to Allah. They are the ones who have humility. 
So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to be in the state of dhikr, to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to not be amongst those who are neglectful, to not be amongst those who have pride, who have arrogance, and to be amongst those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to benefit from this Quran, to study this Quran, and to be able to follow this Quran, just like how the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa obeyed, just like how the Sahaba radiallahu anhum followed. Amin ya Rab. So with that said, inshallah, we will conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma anas lahshati fi qadri. Allahumma arhamni bil Qur'an al-Adheem. Waj'alhu li imaman wa nuran wa hudan wa rahma. Allahumma dhakkirni minhuma nasid. Wa'allimni minhuma jahild. وارزقني تلاوته أنا الليل وأنا النهار وجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين أمين سمامين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته